And, you know, just grading this deal on the surface, I mean, it, you couldn't have two polar opposites in terms of winning and losing. From my perspective, for the Suns, this was a major win for them. Not because it solidifies any type of championship for them, right? They still have a long way to go, and we'll get to that. But in terms of not having much wiggle room, in terms of not having flexibility to maneuver with, with their roster, keeping Chris Paul wasn't going to get them any closer to their goals and would have gotten them closer to the apron with that $30 million guaranteed. Waving him would have only given them just a sliver of cap space. The waving and stretch provisions for Chris Paul would have only given them just a little bit more in cap space. So they weren't working with much. So in my opinion, to be able to turn an aging Chris Paul on that contract and scraps for a bad, for Bradley Beal, to me on the sun side, that was really the best that they could do in terms of trying to upgrade their team. Now, they still have other things that they'll need to do. They need to figure out what they do with DeAndre Ayton. But just on its surface, being able to turn Chris Paul and scraps into Bradley Beal, I get the contract and all of that. To me, for the Suns, what was a win. On the Wizards side, I mean, boy, oh boy, the power of the no-trade clause came to bite the Wizards in the ass, man. Talk about <laughs> mismanagement. A complete, complete terrible job by this Wizards team and trying to even just build a competitive team over the years. They should have traded Bradley Beal years ago when they had the opportunity to. For some reason, they wanted to commit to him while trying to build a championship team around him, which made no sense. You know, a team like Portland's going to find that out with Dame Lillard as well. But for the Wizards, you give the guy no trade clause, you give him a super max, and now you got to take pennies on the dollar to try to figure it out. Yes, this was the best deal in terms of clearing out off the, the books for them. But boy, oh boy, they got nothing back in return, man. Uh, Mo, kick us off, man. W which, how do you grade this deal for, for both sides? I mean, you're talking about winners and losers. So I want to start off as a fan before I get into my analyst back. As a fan, this is a huge win for me because I was terrified that Kevin Durant would carry Chris Paul to an NBA championship. But now I can live comfortably but I'm never going to have to watch CP <laughs> lifting up the Larry O'Brien. So as a fan who's watched wow. Chris Paul over the years, respectfully, and trying to see him win. But, you know, in terms of analyzing the trade from the Phoenix Suns, you were spot on with what they were saying. You know, this is a massive talent upgrade. And, you know, they talk about the depth. The depth was a problem even before this trade happened. That still needs to be addressed. But turning Chris Paul and Andrew Shammert into Bradley Beal, sensational. Bradley Beal, he can be a cutter off the ball. He can play without the ball in his hands. Devin Booker has shown that he can play the point guard position, especially when Chris Paul was out injured. He put up great numbers playing as the primary facilitator. So I like the trade for the Phoenix Suns. I love Matt Ishbia coming and buying a team and not worrying about the money. He said, I bought this team, so I'm going to try and win a championship. I'm going all in. I don't care if it's 200 million in luxury tax. I don't care about the new CBA. We'll cross that bridge where we get to it. Right now, I'm putting all my chips into the middle of the table and we're going to try and win this thing. For the Wizards, I think you know it again. I don't know why you didn't just let Bradley Beal walk as a free agent last summer if you were going to give him a Supermax with a no-trade clause. Because giving him the no-trade clause, not only did that allow him to dictate where he got traded to, it allowed him to dictate the players in the deal. He, uh, I heard whispers that he said to the Wizards, I'm not going to waive my no-trade clause if you're trading for DeAndre Ayton. you got to trade for Chris Paul instead because I'd rather the Suns give up Chris Paul in this deal than Ayton, <laughs> who we could have as our starting center, or we can trade him on for more pieces. So the Washington Wizards should be embarrassed that they put themselves in this position. And now they're going to the old reliable trust the process. We're going to turn into OKC. We're going to clear our space. We're going to let people dump bad contracts on us to give us draft picks. And... For me, I don't respect it. It's just a way of GMs prolonging their career. I can't build a capable team, so now we're just going to tear it all down and start from scratch. And obviously, they've changed their front office over the offseason, but I don't know what the Washington Wizards are doing. Giving Gilbert Arenas that contract back in the day after his knee injury, the John Wall contract, that didn't work out. But the Bradley Beal one might be the worst out of all of them. They were yeah. thinking that Bradley Beal, Kuzma, and Paul Zingas was going to lead them to success this season. I don't know what they were thinking about that. So, you know, looking at this trade, win for the Phoenix Suns, they couldn't have got better for Chris Paul. You know, like you said, they were thinking about waving him. So to get an all-star caliber guard in return for Chris Paul and his contract, 
is an absolutely huge dub for the Phoenix Suns, but they've got a lot of questions that they're going to have to figure out moving forwards. Hmm. I think you guys hit it all on the head with all these talk with all the points that we looked both at these teams. I'm going to start with the Suns first. So for the Suns, if I had to give it a letter grade, I'm probably giving this deal a C just because even though you get Bradley Beal, I understand that you get your your losing Chris Paul guy who you took who helped you get to the NBA Finals, right? But still, I don't see Bradley Beal as a, that major upgrade. What did he do out in Washington with that team? Did he show you that he was that capable leader? The best seasons that he's had was either with John Wall or with Russell Westbrook. So for him, I think you're getting a good talent in, in Bradley Beal. This. For, for, I get it. You get this guy. You're solidified as a playoff team year in and year out. You hope that with the core four that you have between him, Aiton, KD, Booker, you should automatically make the playoffs. The question is, how far can they go? I don't I don't know how far they're going to go. I don't think they're going to win the championship their first year with this, uh, with this roster just because we've seen historically that doesn't happen. But for what, you know, Mo said earlier, you know, with Ishbia, you go in there and you're saying, you know, if we bring back all these guys, we're going to be teetering on the line to that second apron. Why not just burst right through it and just say, let's be competitive for the years that we have. And while I get that for the immediate, it's the future that I have questions with for the Phoenix Suns. We could talk about that a little bit, a little bit later, but right now it, it's a win for them for the sense that you got talent. I wonder how you're going to build out the depth. They say they're going to bring back a lot of the guys like you're going to talk about uh, who was you going to bring back Lee. You think about bringing back Craig. Uh, Dwayne Dedman, everybody else on that roster that you saw was on that during that playoff run. So it should be a good team for the Wizards. I actually grade them a little bit higher, even though historically with that with that deal that you gave Bradley Beal was horrendous for them. Now, opportunities just open up, even though you didn't get the greatest draft haul, you didn't get the greatest talent in return for Bradley Beal because of that no trade clause. You still now have something to look forward to with the new GM running this team. So you think that if you can collect the draft capital, you now have that flexibility of saying it's not Bradley Beal anymore for a GM. He's like, my job is somewhat safe because we're legitimately starting at ground zero. And so for that, I give it like a B minus and for the wizards, a C for the Suns, just because I don't see the future of what the Suns are going to do right now. I I say the only reason, like I get what you're saying with how, you know, Beal fits. They may not necessarily have needed his offense. I'm just saying from squarely from the standpoint of, when they went all in for KD, right? They they stretched out the the contending window, right? When they when they got CP3 in the beginning, that's when the contending window opened. Now they brought in KD, they stretched it out a little bit. They're all in. They put all the chips into the middle. With that and mm-hmm. with the CBA and the uh, the second apron approaching, they really had very little. And all the picks that they gave to the Nets. I mean, the Nets mm-hmm. have their first round pick for basically every other year till twenty nine. Yep. So. My perspective is, given that they have very little to work with, turning Chris Paul into Bradley Beal was better than just turning Chris Paul into, you know, a mid to back end rotation guy, plus a a, a pick here and there. So even though Beal adds on to the wealth of riches offensively and they still need to figure it out, to me, they were able to get the most out of that situation. Now, they still need to figure out the rest on how to balance out the roster, right? They only have about five to six guys on the contract. I've, you have to figure that, you know, they they pair eight and off to maybe increase their depth. Maybe they can get two or three spots, and then we can, we can figure it out from there. But squarely on what they got for Paul, I thought that was a, a win for them. Um, I'm surprised that – well, let, let me ask you this. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this, Mo. Are you surprised that, uh, that Miami didn't have a chance in this? Because all we heard was that they were the front runners. We heard that Beal liked Miami. Him and Butler are cool. We always hear about the legend of Riley, and he throws the rings on the table, and everybody just comes. But he ended up, he, he opted to choose uh, Phoenix, man. You, you surprised he didn't give Miami a chance? You know, everyone criticizes Kevin Durant for always having super teams around him. But I feel like at some point you have to credit him for his ability to recruit star players to play alongside him. You know, this is the man who had Steph Curry willing to take a back seat just to get him to join the team. This is a man who had Kyrie Irving uh, willing to leave Boston and, you know, all the promises he made to that city to go and join up in Brooklyn and then recruit James Harden over there. This is a man who forced his way to Phoenix and now he's recruited Bradley Beal to come and join him there. So credit to Kevin Durant for adding yet another 
all-star Infinity Stone to his gauntlet of teammates over the years. Uh, with Miami, I think if you look at it from the, the way that Miami played, I know Tyler Harrow was out for this postseason run, but their style of play was different without Tyler Harrow in a sense of without the guard that's coming in and creating offense for himself, they're playing a very different style now. So you've got Jimmy as your primary piece, and then you've got the Gabe Vincents, the Max Strusel filling their roles. I don't know if you're Bradley Beal, how you would see yourself fitting in in terms of could the Heat be as successful? Would they be making the NBA Finals again? Not saying that he's a downgrade in talent, but it's about how talent fits into different styles of play. And then teaming up with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, that's an attractive proposition. So I'm not too surprised that Miami lost out in this. Uh, I, I thought it was a toss up. It could go either way. So I'm, I'm not too surprised on that, but I do know that Miami are focusing all of their attention on Damian Lillard right now, which I'm sure we'll talk about later yeah. on. A absolutely. We, we will, man. So to everybody in the chat, once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Uh, Al, how about you, man? Were you surprised? Uh, it, according to the articles, it, Phoenix was it for him, man. He, they crossed off uh, Miami. His, his wife's family's from LA. It, it was said mm -hmm. that KD recruited him. What do you think about that? I was a little shocked. Um, not totally like it, it makes sense just because when you look at the assets that Miami has, I feel like you had to make a decision between either Bradley Beal or Damian Lillard because with Bradley Beal, you know, even though we heard the discussions of like Kyle Lowry, um, who else was it like Duncan Robinson and everybody else in there? Yeah, but you still had to give up some draft capital and Miami's a little low on draft capital and you need that too if you want to go for someone like Damian Lillard who no trade clause can go anywhere that he wants to go right and the team could truly ship him out to like whether it be Boston Philly so for Miami I can see why they tried probably to do as as little as possible but when you look at how Kevin Durant recruited Bradley Beal you think about Beal playing with KD over uh, Butler that makes more sense so at the end you get to play with a great in Kevin Durant. On top of that, you have a young guy, Devin Booker, top 20 player in the league. And you just look at the rest of that roster and you're like, even if it's just very top heavy right now, even if DeAndre Staten, even if DeAndre Ayton stays for this season, right? That core four right there, that's that's pretty dynamic to be playing with. Yeah. Whether when you go look at Miami, it's like, is Tyler Hero going to be healthy? You're losing, if you do trade uh, Kyle Lowry, you're losing that veteran point guard off the bench. Um, how much more does Kevin Love have? Uh, you got to think about re re signing Gabe Vincent, Max Struess. Are those guys even going to be there? The key components to why the Miami Heat made that deep season de season run. So if you're looking at that for Bradley Beal, it's like I think I'd rather go play with the, the top guys over in Phoenix rather than Miami. I think also if you're Bradley Beal and you're looking at the Phoenix Suns, you're like, okay, this new owners come in and within his first week on the job, he's traded for Kevin Durant. Now he's trying to get me. He's actively willing himself to try and win. The Miami Heat, I know that they made it to the NBA Finals. But let's think about how we were talking about the Miami Heat before the playoffs began, right? First of all, they lost the first playing game. They barely made it to the playoffs. They did absolutely nothing at the, the trade deadline. It's not like they were actively making moves to improve that roster. So credit to them for making it to the NBA Finals. But, and I hate to do this, Giannis doesn't hurt his back. Do they win that series? Tatum doesn't turn his ankle. Do they win that game seven? The Knicks had some injuries in that series as well. So it's like Miami were in the finals. Great. But it's like when the Hawks made it to the conference finals, were they really the quality team to make it to the conference finals? Or were they just in the right place at the right time for Ben Simmons to have his meltdown and all these other factors that go into making these runs? So, you know, when you're looking at it like that, Phoenix is a far more attractive destination. My question here, though, is, you know, we're talking about DeAndre Ayton. And this is a league now where you're going to have to go through the Nuggets to win the Western Conference. The Nuggets are big at every position, especially at the five with Nikola Jokic. You saw DeAndre Ayton couldn't really do much against him in the games that he That's did play great. against him. So now you've taken a guy who was a number one draft pick over Luka Doncic, over Trey Young, over all these guys. He's the number one pick in a draft. He comes in. He's the second option. It's him and Booker, Right. Good first season. They would have made it to the playoffs. They went on that run in the bubble. They would have made the playoffs that season if Aiton didn't get the 25-game suspension, but that's besides the point, right? Then Chris Paul comes along. So you've gone from being the second option to now you're the third option. And now Chris Paul goes, but Bradley Beal comes and Kevin Durant joins. Now you're the fourth option. As the number one pick in a draft trying to get your career back on track, 
are you really going to be happy and buy into what the team's trying to do as the fourth option on the team? How there's only a certain amount of possessions in an NBA you're game. But only boss and you're less touches now. You, you're going to be relying on offensive rebounds and lobs off the pick and roll. Is that what you want to do? But more importantly, for the Phoenix Suns, you're paying a guy thirty million dollars to do that moving forwards for the next four years. Is that something that really makes sense? You can get that same production from a Bismack Biombo or a Javel McGee if you've got all these other scoring options on the court. I'm not saying that those guys are as good as DeAndre Ayton, but it's looking at what you need your center to do in the game, right? So yeah. looking at that, it would make sense to trade DeAndre Ayton to fill out depth on the roster. But now my question is, who's willing to take on DeAndre Ayton in the hopes that he can somewhat fulfill his potential as the number one pick, despite not having really shown that since the yeah. season where they made it to the finals, only to lose against Milwaukee. Yeah. And I think and, if you're any team. Yeah, well, go ahead, Bob. I mean, I mean, just going to say in terms of Aiton, you know, his stock is kind of down after a lackluster playoffs too, man. Mm -hmm. I feel like his stock has been just dropping every single season, in all honesty. Like, his stock was at his highest was when they were in the NBA Finals Previous season, he was it was pretty shaky. This season, it was pretty shaky, even outside of the playoffs. And that's just kind of the player that he is. And if there's going to be any team, in my opinion, that wants DeAndre Eaton, it's probably the Dallas Mavericks. He needs a center yeah. position out there. So if you're trying to keep Luka happy, why not go get the former number one overall pick, DeAndre Eaton? He's getting paid. I know that. But I, I, you, I know you got Powell there. If you're trying to entice Kyrie to stay, maybe you create that as a big three and say, hey, this is the talent that we got moving forward. We don't really have a lot of depth, but if you're DeAndre Ayton and you want to show that you can help carry a team, that would be the team to do it. Yeah, I mean, there there are talks that... Uh, they, I mean, there were talks before they even got Bradley Beal that Ayton to the Mavs was was one of the things that, that they were trying to work out, maybe in exchange for the number 10 pick. Maybe Phoenix gets that, flips number 10 to one of these teams in the draft that have multiple picks. The Pacers have three picks in the draft. Do they try to package that up, you know, move back into the draft and get some depth? Because they're going to need defense. They're going to need a defensive anchor at the five. You know, Aiton does not provide that. They don't necessarily need his offense. They're going to need defense. And they're going to need wing depth. And according to the, the draft analysts and the scouts this year, this is one of the best drafts to go get a three and D wing. Do they try to get some depth in the draft and maybe get a three or four year starter, somebody that you can go in, plug and play? No projects, but guys that can come in and, and fill a role right away. You know, the next uh, uh, Christian Browns or, or of the world or maybe somebody a little bit better. I think they're going to need something like that to fill out the back end of the rotation. And then you still have campaign who you got to bring back. He's on a non-guaranteed contract. You have Tory Craig, who they're going to have to use his bird rights and bring him back because they need him as, as a, uh, as a three and D wing. He shot damn near 40% from three last year for them. So they're going to need to make some moves, man. It's going to be very interesting to see how they play this out. But for right now they have, Bradley Beal. Salute to everybody in the chat. Once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. The NBA report live and direct on this Juneteenth. CP the franchise, Alex Otaro, special guest, Mo Muncy of the Hoop Genius Podcast. Call us up with your thoughts on this trade, man. 657-383-1509. Or you can hit us up on the NBA report Discord. All right, I want to get to uh I want to get to Kendrick Perkins' uh, thoughts on this team. And uh, let's react to it. This is this was Kendrick Perkins last night on Sports Center in regards to what he felt like uh, this trade was going to do for the Phoenix Suns. Here it is. Okay, on what two years? Washington is the main piece, although he's not expected to be there long. The Wiz are exploring as well. Big Perkins, Katie, Bradley, Bill, Katie, and D. Book, three of the most prolific scores in the game today on one team. Hey, listen. James Jones is out here selling used cars for Rolls Royce because that's exactly what just happened. The fact that he was able to keep DeAndre Ayton was huge. Look, the Phoenix Suns with this big three should be the favorite of coming out of the West and winning next year's title. Now, I don't know what's going to happen throughout the course of the offseason, and I know we just getting started, but at the end of the day, currently constructed, this is the best team in basketball. When you have this much offensive firepower, it's going to be hard to beat this team in a seven-game series come postseason time. The great thing about it is that they get to jail from training camp. DeAndre Ayton finally have a new coach in Coach Vogel, so we don't have to worry about the tension that him and Monty Williams had. 
It's about to be fireworks this next uh, upcoming season. I can't wait to see what else is happening. All right, so that that was big perk. Never never shy on words, never short on words. Uh, hilarious. I, li- I like perk at ESPN seat, man. He's very entertaining. But this was this was that an entertaining reaction to this trade because there's no way that you could look at this team with only five guys on on the contract, five six guys on the contract. You know, two of those guys being guys that wouldn't even crack your average rotation. You have three offensive, good firepower, great firepower. You got three, two, three of the best shooters in the game, three great closers. You look at Bradley Beal's clutch numbers. He was great. Book, Katie, come on. But without even looking at what they fill out in the back end, you got two guys in, in Beal and KD that have durability issues. KD has been playing less and less games. Bradley Beal played 50 games last year. Uh, Book had, a, had, a, had an injury, I believe, last year as well. But he's the more durable of the three. So they've got that to contend with. They still have to build out the roster. And then when I look at the West, obviously Denver, it's going to run through Denver and put some respect on their name. They just won the championship. We'll see how the Clippers look at full health. You know, those are the Los Angeles load managements. If they can make it through a full 82, we'll see how they look <laughs> because they certainly have the depth. Um, you know, what do the Kings do? Do the Kings make an upgrade? Do they improve their defense and make another leap? <laughs> right. Like you, you got teams. You got teams in the West that I don't even see the Suns better than at right now. Look at that East. A healthy Milwaukee team to me is still better than th- this Suns unit. Celtics. I, I think you can go neck and neck. Celtics kind of proved to be a little bit soft this year, but I say that to say I, I'm not ready to crown these guys champions because they got a lot of work to do, man. So, well, what, what's your take on that? I mean, you say the Celtics are soft, but. Don't forget who this Phoenix team are. If we're talking about being soft, they got punked by Luka Doncic in Game Seven. After talking all of that, they showed time and Jalen Brunson. Don't forget Jalen Brunson. Don't forget our guy Jalen Brunson. That's right. Facts, that's right. Facts, that's facts, right. facts, facts. But you know what I'm saying? Time and time again, they try and upload the videos of them working out, or they have a parade for making it out <laughs> of the Western Conference Finals. They're soft. Okay, let's get that one out of the way first. The, the Celtics, at least, you know, they're a young up and coming team. Let's not forget that. This to sort the of Phoenix, they got to go all in. But to me, this whole thing, it, ma- it makes me question, did anyone actually watch the NBA Finals? Did anyone actually watch what happened? You have Jokic, who's the star of your team. You have Murray, who's the co-star. And you have Michael Porter Jr., who is supposedly the third star. He had an awful Finals, right? There's no guarantee that in a seven-game series, all three of your guys are going to play well. The defense is going to take something away. A team might commit to saying, okay, cool, we're going to double-team Devin Booker and make sure he can't get off or whatever it might be. We're going to go at Bradley Beal. We're going to try and target Kevin Durant. Now he's a little bit older, whatever, whatever it might be. So if one of your guys doesn't get going, like Michael Porter Jr. Couldn't get going in the finals. It was the Aaron Gordons. It was the Bruce Browns. It was the Christian Browns. It was the Contavious Colwell Popes that won Denver, the championship. Yes. The superstars, Yogi Jamari did that thing, but the depth is what helped them win the NBA championship. Not only that, the depth is what got them the one seed and home court advantage throughout the postseason. True. So when you actually watch how the game is played, the Phoenix Suns can be a very impressive team. They've got the offensive firepower. They can be great in a regular season. What happens if one of their big three gets injured? What happens when they get into a playoff matchup and one of their guys struggles? Where is the depth? That's what I'm looking to find out. Are you going to move Aiton for more pieces or are you going to somehow try and convince guys to sign for the minimum? Whatever it might be, Depth is essential in winning an NBA championship. And then talking about winning an NBA championship, everyone says defense wins championships. Is Bradley Beal a good defender? Devin Booker, when he when he's locked in, he looks very serviceable on defense. But how often do you see him locked in on defense? Kevin Durant, with his wingspan, his you know his movement, he can be good on defense. However, he's another year older. He's got more injuries on his body. So where's the defense coming from with this squad? So it's like, to me, you've just watched a team that's very deep and has multiple athletic, big body defenders that they can throw at guys in the playoffs, win the NBA championship. That's the model of what wins in the NBA. Going all in with a top heavy heavy team, this is why I struggle with this discussion right now, is it's the exact same discussion we had when Brooklyn traded for James Harden. Yeah. Yes. Is the exact same. We're having the same conversation, just like, what is it, 18 months or maybe less, that we had about Brooklyn making a big three. You've now got three guys who can all score the basketball. One of those guys is Kevin Durant, right? And you've got a very thin roster behind it. Now, the obvious advantage is that 
Phoenix don't have Steve Nash attempting to coach on the sidelines. That's a very distinct advantage that they have over the Brooklyn Nets. But we've seen this in the NBA. Having three of these guys on a roster as three score-heavy guys isn't the recipe that you're looking for. But I'm not going to criticize them for it because it was the best available move to them based on the contracts that they, they're given out. You obviously can't go back in a time machine and change Chris Paul's deal or, you know, DeAndre Ayton doesn't have his issues with Monty Williams. It was the best available move, but to say Kendrick Perkins coming out and saying they're the favorites to win it all, I think that's outrageous. It almost as if Kendrick Perkins doesn't actually watch the NBA. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Mo, I couldn't agree with you more, especially when it comes to death, what we saw throughout this entire postseason and, you know, that was the same thing that we saw for the Brooklyn Nets too, right? They gave up all their depth and they had to rely on their big three. And how far did it go? A second round appearance against the Milwaukee Bucks who had the depth, had the star power, and were able to win the championship that year against the very same Phoenix Suns. But the thing that I look at also just historically, the old adage, history repeats itself. Not many teams constructed in the first year have success winning a championship. Yes, we can look at the Los Angeles Lakers when they got Anthony Davis that one year and they went into the bubble and they won the entire thing that year with LeBron James. But you also have LeBron James. You also have Anthony Davis, two of the top 10 guys that, that year that season. They don't have, in my opinion, two of the top 10 guys on this Phoenix Suns. Like I said, Booker, top 20 guy in this league, right? You have Bradley Beal, probably a top 40 guy in this league. Kevin Durant is your only top 10 guy on this roster. But I'm also looking at where's the defense coming from. I don't see where that's going to come from. All these guys could be serviceable defenders uh, when they're all locked in, but that's not what you want from them on a day to day, on a night to night basis. These are your offensive guys. That's what they do. Now, what, when you go back historically, like I said, and look at teams that are constructed in their first year, I think about Boston when they made the trade and got KG and Paul Pierce. They didn't, uh, not Paul Pierce, um, and, and Ray Allen. They didn't win their first year when they all were together. I look at the Miami Heat, right? When you got LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. That team is more talented than what we're talking about right now, even with Chris Bosh. They didn't win their first year. They lost to the Dallas Mavericks. We talk about the first year with LeBron James. We went back to the Cavs. Yeah, he had that team dealt with some injuries. You lose Kevin Love, you lose Kyrie Irving, but they did not win their first year. You look at the Brooklyn Nets. The first year they were constructed with Kyrie and KD. They did not win. Even when KD returned, they still didn't win. When you get James Harden, they did not win. We can look at the Phoenix Suns, right? As soon as you got Chris Paul on that team, yeah, they went to the NBA Finals, but they didn't win. Most often than not, teams that are constructed have a playoff appearance like we've seen with the Clippers, like we've seen with the Rockets, whether it's when the Rockets have gotten CP3, whether they got Russell Westbrook, Clippers getting Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. This team's going to be a, play, a playoff team, no doubt about it. To say that they're going to win the championship, that takes time, takes chemistry. That's the other thing I think we're forgetting that we just saw with the Denver Nuggets. And what we saw with the Milwaukee Bucks is that it takes time for these guys to gel together, under, understand each other's tendencies, and to actually have a full-out plan. When the Miami Heat won their first title with that big three, they had just finished their first season together. There was a second year they all played together. So they understand each other's tendencies. They understand the roles that they had to play and who had to give up what. I just, it's going to be hard for what we have is now four guys. I know we keep talking about a big three, but Aiton has to now, if he stays on this team, has to understand how to be a fourth option after being a third and once was a second. Devin Booker, what it, where does he fall on that chain? Is he the number two option? Is he going to be a number three option? Is he going to change on a night-to-night -night basis? Bradley Beal, who was that guy on the Wizards, right? Now you're telling him to be that same thing with Devin Booker, either two or three? That's yeah. tough to figure out. Man. So That's tough to figure out. It's a lot of sacrifices that have to be made. Um, I thought to Mo's point, the, the finals have shown you you, you need the depth. You need positional versatility, which is what Denver had. You need size. I think size wins. You know, Miami showed, yes, with the small lineups with Bam, they could be competitive. But once they got to the big stage, they got overpowered. They got outmatched. You know, small ball will only take you but so far if you're matched up with some good size. And I thought that's what Denver had. But, you know, it's just the, the big three concept versus building organically is such an interesting debate because you have these new salary cap rules that's supposed to limit teams' abilities to put a big three out there or else they're going to pay the price. Uh, but then you look at the the past finals winners, right? And yes, they had this, the depth and they had the versatility and they had well coached, but the star power of their organic homegrown talent was always there. If you go from Jokic 
to Giannis to uh, you know you go Warriors Steph dynasty, Curry. the Spurs dynasty, the Celtics when they won. Yes, it was KG and everything's possible, but it started with Paul Pierce, right? It, it took a Al Jefferson to get you a KG. Like the the it it starts in the draft as well, and and the the Suns were on their way. They they drafted Book. Right, they 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 found a, a diamond in the rough in book. What was the late lottery pick? It was eleven or fourteen, I think. Right? Yeah, around there. They got eaten. They got eaten with the number one pick. They were competitive in the bubble. They were able to flip some assets to get to Paul. They got to the finals last year. To me, was their best team. They won sixty something games last year and flopped out in the playoffs, and and they just weren't there good enough. So now they're in on his big three, but it just. If you don't have LeBron, as it seems like, you're not gonna have that instant success. It, it's to win an NBA championship, you need a top three player in the NBA. Like that season that you win, Jokic clearly top three player in the NBA. Yeah. Last season, whatever in the regular season, but in, in the playoffs, Stephen Curry was clearly a top three player. Giannis clearly a top three player. Every year LeBron won it, top three player. You know, it's very rare unless you're the Phoenix Suns or the Detroit Pistons to win championships without a top three player. Kevin Durant turns 35 before this season begins. Yeah. Can he be a top three player in the NBA? I don't know. you got Jokic. He's not going anywhere. Giannis is going to be more motivated than ever. Embiid's got to figure something out because he can't afford to go out in the playoffs like he did go outside again. Yeah. And then you've got all the other players coming through. And in a seven-game series, are you really going to take anyone over LeBron James, even though... 39 and he seems to defy time so i understand why they made this move but it gives them a very short window sure they have sure. a two to three year window to win this because KD, as i said he's 35 before the season begins how many more years have you him? he's got what two or three years left on his deal you've got booker who's not going anywhere yeah and then you've got bradley bill and the important part about the no trace clause it may come back to bite phoenix because if they decide if Kevin Durant wants to move on, retire elsewhere, whatever it may be, Bradley Beal still has his no trade clause, right? Because he was traded to the Suns, he retains that clause is in his contract. So now you basically have to win in the next two or three years, and then you're going to have to start over or try and somehow get pieces around Devin Booker once again. So the pressure is on them, and I think they're going to be a good team. You know, there's no doubt they're going to be a playoff team. I think they can go far in the Western Conference, but I don't think they have the depth necessary to be an NBA championship. I've seen someone in the chat asking, why does depth matter? Because it's only eight guys in a post rotation. Yeah. Well, different players are suited to different matchups, right? You saw in the Miami Heat's run to the finals, Duncan Robinson barely played the last two years. He comes in and they found matchups that work for him, make him able to contribute. Yeah. If they only had eight serviceable players on their roster and no depth, then they wouldn't be able to find guys like that. If someone goes out injured, you need guys to be able to step up and fill in. So that's the, the question regarding depth, and that's why you need more than just eight guys to win a championship. Yeah, you might end up in the finals only playing that seven, eight-man rotation, but to get to the finals throughout an 82-game season and then through the whole playoffs, you need 10 guys that can go out there and produce. Yeah, and it's as you said, you look at Miami, you know, there were games where Kevin Love went from a DMP to starting. You have Highsmith, Caleb Martin coming in in hero spot. Um, you look at Denver, every game, every game there was a different role player that emerged. It was Bruce Brown, it was a, um, Aaron Gordon, it was Christian Brown, it was uh, Jeff Green at the end of game four that, that went in and he played small when they lost Jokic in the fourth quarter. So different guys need to step in and having that depth and versatility is going to help. It's also going to help you get through the regular season. As you said, that Denver team, whereas Miami said, well, we're going to coast until the All-Star break, that Denver team said, well, we're going to play for the whole thing and go through our peaks and valleys, but the depth is is was what certainly uh, carried them through.